Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here with everyone today as we discuss one of the most important topics that I think is really on the horizon of what's happening when it comes to outsourcing. Uh, when it uh, comes to outsourcing currently as we go into the second half of the year and going into 2021. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Ryan and I am the President and Chief Analyst of Ryan Strategic Advisory. Now, Ryan Strategic Advisory is a boutique consulting firm that focuses on the outsourcing sector based in Montreal, Quebec in the heartland of Canada. And I'm very, very delighted to be with you today speaking to people who are literally tuning in from all over the world. As we take a look at the participants who are, are logging on, I can see many individuals who are joining us from the United States, from my home country of Canada, from different parts of the Caribbean. I see people joining from Western Europe, from Africa. So truly a global discussion in regards to what Jamaica has to offer as a resilient location for outsourcing. I'm also very, uh, I'm very delighted to be joined by a number of distinguished individuals in their own right who are going to be taking part in a panel discussion, as well as presenting a little bit later on. Uh, that includes Diane Edwards and Vivian Scully from Jampro. We've got Anand Buridar from HGS and Yanni Epstein from ITEL BPO. So welcome to everybody. And if we can go on to the next slide we can talk a little bit about what's going to be happening with regards to our discussion today following a few ground rules. Now, as anybody who has participated in a webinar will be aware, making sure that one of these events goes as swimmingly as possible takes into account a number of different uh, shall we say, rules or, or elements uh, in terms of how we would ask everybody to proceed as we go through this discussion. To let everybody know, this webinar is being recorded. The recording device is active and the webinar will in fact be published at a later date. Now, in terms of the participants, all video and audio capabilities have been turned off. So that means that anybody who is logged on will not be seen or will not be heard throughout the course of the discussion. But that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. That doesn't mean that we aren't interested in what you have to say or questions that you might want to ask. So if you do have a question, if I could request that you please type it into the question, the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. All you need to do is click on Q&A and you'll be able to type in your question and the team at JAMPRO will be taking a look to, to make sure that your question will be answered. We'll do our best to answer it. If we aren't able to over the course of the webinar, we'll certainly come back to you on email. Now, what I would just say is that no verbal questions will be allowed. One of the things that we have seen on other webinars over the course of the past few months has been uh, perhaps uh, organizations that have turned on the microphones of participants. We won't be doing that today. Rather, what we'll be doing is taking the questions from the Q&A box. So I can't stress enough, if you've got a question, whether it's for the panelists or for myself, please make sure to use that Q&A box. Let's be as interactive as possible. That's what makes, as far as I'm concerned, a good webinar. It's not just participation amongst the panelists or the presenters, it's also with the audience. So please uh, take into account, we really want to hear what you have to say. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a presentation that will take into account why Jamaica is really, I think, uh, disrupting when it comes to BPO resilience. So I'm going to share my screen here very quickly. So just bear with me. Now we'll get my, my slides up in presentation mode. And one of the things I want to talk a little bit about as an analyst or an advisor who has been in this industry for nearly 20 some years is the fact that resilience when it comes to outsourcing delivery or finding a location that's got resilience when it comes to business continuity and the, the capability of being seamless in any type of a BPO operation. That's been a very important factor, but, but really no more important, I think, than we've seen it uh, over the course of the past five or six months. We, we're at a primordial time right now in the industry. And I want to talk a little bit about this trend or this factor as it relates to Jamaica itself. 
Now, many individuals uh, on the call will know that I have been following Jamaica and made many trips to Jamaica in regards to the BPO sector over the course of my career. And I've been thoroughly impressed every single time I've been down to take a look not just at the BPO operations, but also the energy and the innovation that you find on the ground from professionals that are involved in this industry. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these as well as other key trends over the course of my presentation that should last about maybe 10 minutes or so. Just a, a bit of an idea about the structure of the presentation, a quick introductory points, talk a, a little bit about as well some key post-pandemic BPO priorities, what Ryan Strategic Advisory anticipates will be important going forward as we move out of the COVID-19 period, why Jamaica is in an advantageous position, position in this regard, and then wrap it up with a few final thoughts. So in terms of the past several months, it's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic has really, I think, thrown a wrench in terms of what outsourcers and their clients were anticipating in regards to steadfast BPO delivery. What companies are looking for, what the clients of outsourcers are looking for, as well as the outsourcers themselves, is to be able to find a location to source a place that's going to provide reliable and stable delivery in order to ensure seamless interactions for consumers. Now, in my opinion, locations that are closer to the home have an immediate advantage in that regard. It's very clear that uh, that nearshore locations are, are much more popular than they ever have been, and there's a lot of reasons for this. Now, some of these reasons I, I think we can identify directly as it comes down to Jamaica in the American near shore discussion. Some of the reasons why Jamaica is continuing and I think will continue for an extended period to gain interest from outsourcers that perhaps are already on the ground and want to expand or ones that aren't yet there. Well, there's obviously a very, very strong reputation for quality delivery when it comes to third party services. There's a workforce in Jamaica that is very solid and associated with good quality and a good work ethic. The location of Jamaica and its cities and its international airports are incredibly accessible for prospective or existing clients of outsourcers and the outsourcing executives themselves. And it's got a proven track record. And the, the reality too is I think this should uh, not be, this, should, this needs to be understated is the fact that Jamaican BPO is built upon a very strong partnership between the industry itself, the industry players and the government of Jamaica. So some opening thoughts that I'd ask everyone to consider as we go through the discussion today. Now, what are some of the key BPO priorities in a post pandemic world as we're moving into the second half of 2020 and going into 2021? I think that there's a lot of elements that outsourcers are looking to prioritize in terms of the resiliency of the location. And it's interesting because uh, as we were going through this discussion yesterday, as some of us, uh, some of the participants and, and I were chatting, there was a lot of different core elements that, uh, that came up in terms of what buyers are looking for and what the outsourcers who are working with the buyers are looking to prioritize. Clearly, location diversification is essential. In my opinion, and I was saying this to some of the panelists before we hopped on the webinar today, the days of an organization housing the overwhelming majority of its capacity from an outsourcing standpoint in a single location are done. The idea about diversifying across multiple locations that are reliable and have a good reputation is going to be a priority going forward for outsourcers and it's going to be demanded by the outsourcers clients. Quality workforce, a quality workforce, not just in terms of understanding what to do in an outsourcing scenario, but being adaptable is going to be essential as well. And this is obviously very key, especially as we've gone through the pandemic period. Proactive policymaking is something that I think is very important. And this is something that was suggested to me most recently as we were preparing for the discussion today, and I think makes a lot of sense. Being able to be in a location that is not just going to be resilient, but also has a government that's going to be flexible and adaptable to the needs of the industry to make sure that the industry can perform best and seamlessly over the course of a disruptive period is really, really key. Having policymakers that listen to the industry and respond in kind can't be uh, underlined enough. Network connectivity, obviously crucial as we look towards different types of working models that come forward 
over the course of a disruptive period, especially as individuals are going to work from home. And a location that's got a proven track record in being able to not just do great bricks and mortar work, but also work that's being done from an individual's uh, or an individual agent's residence is obviously very essential. So being able to be flexible, to adapt and having the connectivity is just so, so key. And finally, accessibility. I think it's very clear, and, and again, some of us were chatting a little bit about this as we were preparing for the discussion today. Uh, in an industry that's well known for travel and executives spending lots of time on airplanes or in transit going from their headquarters to a different site, it's gonna be a lot different going forward where in my opinion, you're gonna have far fewer individuals willing to travel the 17, 18 hours to get to a contact center delivery site or an outsourcing delivery site. Rather, there's gonna be much more of a focus on finding locations that can be accessed easily and in shorter times. So let's consider now what buyers are saying in terms of what they're looking for in an offshore location. And I'd like to preface this slide by talking a little bit about the Ryan Strategic Advisory 2020 Front Office BPO Omnibus Survey. Ryan Strategic Advisory annually does a survey of buyers of front office BPO services. And in this year's survey, we surveyed uh, roughly 540 people we surveyed them from across a whole series of different countries. What I've done here is I've broken out the results that came in from North American respondents. And what we find is that from the roughly 200 individuals who are contact center decision makers at enterprises in the United States and Canada, well, they favor a number of different elements from an offshore or a nearshore location. But some of the most important ones include a government, uh, the location has to have a government and a regulatory framework that is going to be pro-business and pro-commerce and reacts to the needs of the industry. The labor force has to be able to bring not just a degree of scalability, but also language skills, a very strong language skills and referenceability to the operation in order to ensure the most seamless interactions as possible. I would say that certainly the reliability of the power grid as well as the reliability and the robustness of connectivity also are very, very important. Certainly our lower operating costs. I mean, if you want to go to an offshore location, certainly cost and the ability to recoup some degree of arbitrage is important. But equally too is the adherence to global data protection laws, which we know is, is essential in an era where we're facing a, a great deal of crime as it relates to information security. So keeping these things in mind, I want to talk a little bit about now why Jamaica is in an advantageous position in terms of expanding existing BPO operations or potentially having new BPO operations set up as we move into the second half of this year and into 2021. Now, obviously, I've got a, a number of reasons here, compelling reasons, I think, why Jamaica makes sense from a BPO standpoint. And I obviously want to take these into account as we have a discussion with the panel, but I'm going to enunciate a few of them here. First of all, a very, very pro-business uh, government that responds strongly to the needs of the industry. I think that's essential, and this is something that Jamaica has proven that it's got. There's also an active industry association, an industry association that's been able to help drive uh, an understanding within the policymaker community about what Jamaica needs to do, what, it, what needs to happen in order to ensure the best possible playing field for BPOs, not just to operate, but also to thrive. And I think this is something that Jamaica has truly been able to achieve between the industry association, the industry players themselves, and the government. Obviously, Jamaica has proven itself as a great location for home-based work to happen. Virtual working is going to be much more of a factor, and I'm sure that we'll talk about this in the panel discussion, but Jamaica has proven over the course of the past several months, it's a location where this business model actually can thrive. The connectivity in Jamaica is very, very strong too, whether it's telephone, whether it's internet, this is not something that any prospective BPO needs to be concerned with. It's robust and it's able to ensure the most seamless interactions possible between an agent based in Jamaica and a consumer, whether they're based in the United States, Canada, or elsewhere. Understanding and empathy with the North American consumer is something that I think Jamaica is truly, truly blessed with in regards to one of its competitive advantages. The fact that it's only a very short distance 
from the United States and Canada means a great deal. It means that there's been a lot of exposure to people who have been traveling in and out of Jamaica by the agent community it just in terms of passing, but also many of the agents themselves have had the chance to travel to North America as well as live in North America. And they bring these skills to the, to the customer experience or to the uh, outsourcing operation as they do mother tongue English. Obviously, individuals in Jamaica grow up speaking very high quality English. They grow up instinctive in English and they understand especially North American English. It's very adaptable that way. Access is something that I think we have to be very clear on too. It's quite easy and straightforward to get in and out of Jamaica's international airports to many, many commercial points in North America. And Jamaica itself has also got a very strong track record in not just attracting some of the biggest global outsourcers, but also having developed a very thriving domestic outsourcing community. And we'll talk a little bit about this track record and this ability to try and uh, bring in or the, the fact that there's many, many companies that have set up and have done very well as homegrown Jamaican operators. And I've got several of them here. Uh, certainly some of the most important names in the world that are operating and thriving in Jamaica right now, as well as some of the homegrown operators. I, I, I note that we've got uh, one of the, the most important ones in the form of ITEL BPO joining us today in the form of Yanni Epstein, as well as one of the most important ones and one of the most successful ones globally in the form of HGS. So we're gonna have a chance to hear a little bit about how operators on both sides of that fence have found setting up and have found operating in Jamaica going forward. Accessibility, I wanna talk a little bit about too. And I think that this bar chart really tells the tale of the tape in many ways. I know there's many individuals who are on this webinar today who have had the opportunity to travel all over the world to see different sites, to see different uh, delivery models in, in all four corners. What I would say is take a look at if you were going from one of the major commercial centers in the United States or Canada, New York, Chicago, or Toronto, and take a look at the amount of travel time you would need to consider if you were to go to Montego Bay or Kingston versus some of the more uh, far-flung offshore locations. Notwithstanding the fact that we've seen great delivery from many different parts of the world, the reality is moving forward, there's going to be a lot less willingness on the part of individual executives to spend that amount of time traveling, spend that amount of time on airplanes. And you can see where Jamaica's accessibility from some of the major commercial centers in the US and Canada truly will be attractive and truly will make sense to a great, to, to a great deal of them. And just for your own information, this information itself, the data I collected for this slide was from flighttimecalculator.com. So just to, as a point of, of reference there. And favorability, thinking about North American buyers in the same Ryan Strategic Advisory front office BPO survey that we did in 2020, we see that Jamaica finds itself in a very advantageous place. We can see that Jamaica is in the, the top 10 of locations uh, with regards to where buyers, contact center buyers would like their outsourcers to be. Certainly a great position for Jamaica as it stands, a, a very, very, uh, certainly playing from a position of strength. And this is one of the reasons why I think outsourcers have done so well and, and found such a hospitable welcome into the country. And it's because their buyers, the, the actual clients they're working with are truly interested in using Jamaica as a spot where they'd like to leverage great front office BPO delivery. So just a few wrap ups here. Uh, I think that obviously outsourcers are going to have a new set of priorities when they're picking a location going forward. Some of the most important of these elements will include great connectivity when it comes to being able to communicate with the rest of the world. Accessibility, being able to get out in and out of a country seamlessly in short amounts of uh, travel time. And certainly, I, I think having that track record of being a location of choice for both upstart operators as well as some of the more global names. Now, for North American investors, obviously Jamaica is an attractive option and will remain so going into the second half of this year and definitely into 2021. I think that the efforts on the part of the trade association, the government, as well as the individual players working together is, is truly paying off. And with such a focus on BCP and business continuity, uh, certainly alongside that of quality and the ability to deliver quality interactions, 
Jamaica is certainly in a position of advantage as we move into the second half of this year and into 2021. So with that in mind, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go on mute. I'll pass it over to my friend uh, Vivian Scully from JAMPRO, who is going to talk a little bit about some of the findings and some of the policy initiatives uh, that JAMPRO are, are looking to try and promote. So Vivian, over to, over to you. Thank you, Peter. Excellent presentation. So good morning, everyone. Jamaica is not just open for beaches, but we're open for business. And this goes well for the planned expansion of the BPO sector. Jamaica's resiliency has elevated the country to a leading location for BPO in the Caribbean. With strong government support and facilitation, this has fueled the sector, helping to create exponential growth 20% for the past five years. Jamaica's BPO landscape has tripled over the last 10 years, demonstrating success and strength in its business environment. At the start of 2020, companies in the sector employed over 40,000 persons servicing international clients and customers across the globe. So much that we have earned a number one spot in the Caribbean, number six in Latin America for doing business, number six worldwide for starting a business. We can register a company in 24 to 48 hours. And despite Montego Bay leading in BPO services over the years, Kingston is now recognized as a leading BPO city by a popular publication near Shore Americas. And now amidst COVID-19, and the increased demand for contact center outsourced services, we are poised for more growth in 2021. I'm gonna quickly share three of the top reasons for Jamaica's BPO resiliency. And these lie around our telecoms, energy, and government support for industry. Our telecoms infrastructure, fueled by two major telecom providers, have provided sufficient reliability and redundancy to ensure maximum uptime and network availability. Through several investments and a projected data traffic of about 20% and fixed lines by about 12%, we are seeing where investments in the sector will continue to provide stability to facilitate work from home significantly to ensure the success of providers in the country. Our energy investments, with Jamaica having the largest hybrid energy storage facility in the Caribbean, is expected to improve our reliability over the island's power supply during periods of intermittency, caused especially by renewables on the grid. Our future investment in the sector will issue an additional 500 megawatts of new energy to strengthen the grid and reduce costs going into 2021. Jamaica intends to generate half of its energy from renewables by mid-2037, amidst an overall target to add 1.6 gigawatts of new capacity to our electricity grid. In the area of government support, outstanding government support has kept the BPO sector operating without significant disruption during this moment of crisis. The government and its Ministry of Health has been very inclusive in its decision-making process including the Industry Association, the Global Services Association of Jamaica, in all its planning efforts, work from home was quickly facilitated by the government within the special economic zones and allowing essential worker status for the movement of workers during restricted times. Implementing health ministry guidelines that allow the sector to revert to full operations after any temporary lockdown or quarantine was swiftly executed. COVID-19 protocols implemented increase, included increased transportation from home to office drop-offs, more trips to reduce the numbers of persons on vehicles, pre-screening of employees, temperature checks, and sufficient social distancing within office spaces. As a next step, we're looking to enhance dialogue between telecoms and power infrastructure to ensure 
sufficient grid and data uh, connectivity for workers in the sector. The long-term solutions are being worked on for virtual business models for work from home and the drafting of a comprehensive risk preparedness plan specifically for the sector and not just for COVID to ensure business continuity during difficult times. One of the other feature of growth and success in Jamaica is Jampro's business support services to new and existing companies. We provide market intelligence. We support on in the area of site selection for office space and even housing for um, overseas staff, facilitating the introduction of key stakeholders to real estate agents, HR consultants, and legal accounting firms. And our aftercare service is excellent in ensuring continued success of companies in Jamaica. Today, as we hear from two of our amazing business providers in Jamaica, ITEL and AGS, as well as the president of Jampro, we will hear first and some of the interesting strategies and experiences that keeps Jamaica open for business. Great, well, thank you, uh, Vivian. Some fantastic food for thought there. And ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare to go into our panel discussion, I would just uh, ask that everybody continue to send in their questions and please do it by the Q&A box. Uh, the Q&A box is the required forum for any questions that you may have. So please send those through on the small Q&A icon that you'll have at the bottom of your screen. I know that we've had a couple of questions come through on the chat panel. Uh, we could, we'd like to try and keep that clear as much as we possibly can. So using that Q&A function at the bottom of the screen is the best place to pose a question to any of the panelists or to myself. But Vivian, again, thank you for the discussion and for the slides that you just uh, passed over to us. I, I think that that it frames up the questions that I would like to ask the panel very, very nicely. And what I'd like to do is perhaps start on the panel discussion. Uh, Vivian, if you would uh, be happy to, to stay on and to keep your microphone live. From your own observations, if you could give me a sense, and I'll start with you and I'll, I'll follow up on this one with Yanni. Could you tell us, in your opinion, what the impact of the pandemic on the outsourcing space in Jamaica has been, and how have the sector's players picked up the baton and run with it? Well, Vivian, I think that you're on mute. Oh, Peter, Hi. excellent question. Um, we've seen the sector respond um, very um, quickly to the pandemic and rejigging their operations to ensure not only for continuity but protection of the workers. They've moved significant amount of their workforce into um, work from home. They've worked very closely to the, with the government adhering to the, the guidelines to ensure um, low spread of, of any um, infections within office centers centers and though we've had a, a few they have been quickly contained and their customers and clients have been sufficiently um, serviced throughout the entire period. Great stuff thank you. Yanni what are your thoughts on this as an operator and as an operator that uh, obviously was was taken I think as we all were a bit aback by the rapid spread of, of COVID-19 what has ITEL BPO done in order to take the situ situation and make the best of it? Thanks, um, Peter. You know, it has been, as you said, a, a shock to, to all of us and, it, and how it spread so quickly. But I think, um, you know, I, I have to, to really put it back on, on our team members um, that very quickly moved our, you know, the agents in facilities into work at home. As, as you know, we have a, a pretty extensive and large workforce that works at home in the US and now Canada. Um, that, that gave us a, a leg up and, a, and an edge on, on some of the, the players on the ground in order to essentially roll out our teams a lot faster. One of the, one of the other edges I would say is that, you know, because Jamaica is, is such a, a big delivery center for us as a country versus some of our other competitors, our, our, our IT guys 
didn't have to focus on the Philippines and India and other larger jurisdictions that were shutting down at similar times. Um, and we could have, you know, focused our energy on ensuring that our, you know, team members in Jamaica were were set up to go to work at home. Um, you know, we we were able to get out about 80% of our workforce uh, within the first few weeks of, of you know, the initial um, pandemic scare. And then, you know, as, as, you know, cases started to increase in Jamaica, uh, we were able to, as I said, get our IT team and our operations teams to set people up at home. You know, it, it, it was, it was rough. I'm not going to try and sugarcoat it to, to say it was, it was an easy, easy job. I mean, it was rough in pushing out, you know, 80% of 2,100 people into work at home. It was rough settling them once they got home because, you know, obviously it's a different work environment. They're used to, to um, being in a, in a campus like setting. They're used to having their supervisor uh, within walking distance from them. And now they're, they're having to, you know, acclimatize themselves to, to using a, a chat tool or calling their, their, um, their supervisor or uh, SME agent over a phone or video chat versus, um, you know, putting somebody on hold and, and standing up and calling to them or walking down the aisle to get to them. So there was a big climatization on, on the part of the agents as well as, as our leadership on the ground. But I would say after the first two to three weeks of it, you know, things really started to settle and, and, you know, we've seen tremendous benefits um, from it, you know, lower attrition, lower absenteeism, um, same or better productivity um, from, from our agents, you know, and, and, and as things have gone on, we've now started to bring some people back into, into the facilities um, for different reasons. And we're, we're now about 50, 50 um, from where we were originally. Well, thanks, Yoni. And it, it certainly speaks, I think, to the ability of uh, not just certainly the executives and the management within BPO operation, but it cascading all the way down to people who are on the front lines to, to work as a team, to pick the ball up and to make sure that the interactions that are being delivered for consumers, either domestically or overseas, are going to be as rock solid as possible. So some great testament to that in regard to the resilience of the labor force. Now, we're very fortunate, ladies and gentlemen, to have the president of JAMPRO, Diane Edwards, on the line with us. And Diane, if you would be so kind as to unmute your microphone, I, I have a query for yourself. Obviously, we've talked a lot over the course of uh, the discussion about the ability for the government to work in tandem with the industry in order to make sure that there's the most level playing field as possible and to be as competitive as possible in what's truly a, a very uh, competitive global industry. Could you talk to us a little bit about what the Jamaican government has done to legislate safe BPO workplaces? And once you're finished on that, I, I'd be curious, Anand, if you could jump into the discussion and talk a little bit about how, uh, by your experience, the industry has been able to adapt to some of these new regulations and new realities. Thanks for that question, Peter, which I think also came from the audience. So great to hear all these questions from the audience this morning. Um, one of the things I think that has really been important for us is exactly as you said, an active outsourcing organization in the form of the Global Sourcing, um, Global Services Association of Jamaica, which actually JAMPRO fostered the establishment of and I think it's really important that we were able to establish when COVID broke out a tripartite group between the GSAJ, the Private Sector Association, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, and the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation. So everybody came together to look at how can we establish these protocols which had not existed before to make the, the BPO operation um, a seamless and con continuity, to allow continuity. So we really looked at um, the, the hygiene protocols and the health protocols. The first thing was really to decide that the BPO industry was an essential industry. And I think that that was critical in allowing, we didn't have a full lockdown in Jamaica, but we had a partial lockdown of most industries. So allowing the, the outsourcing industry to be an essential industry, allowed people to continue to work and to move around. And then we looked at how do we make uh, workplaces um, more accessible and in a healthy way. 
So we had to go through a 14 day period of, of pretty much total lockdown of the industry to allow sanitization, deep cleaning, et cetera, which was done and to develop a set of protocols between that group, as I said, between the government and the private sector working together in tandem. And Jampro was also present in those discussions to look at issues of coming back into the workplace. So social distancing is definitely one. The positioning of hand sanitizers is another. The wearing of masks, um, the, the num removing the numbers of people and so enabling work from home, as Yanni said, which was critical to reducing the numbers of people and the density of people in, in those workplaces. So there are a number of measures, um, even the, the actual distancing of desks and cubicles. Some places have put up um, perspex separators, um, a number of, of different, there, there's about there's a heavy protocol that has been established, which actually goes through all of the physical um, attributes, which Jampro itself has had to, to implement of how you operate a workplace in a healthy way. And we have been pretty successful in terms of a country of managing the COVID outbreak because we have had, we're now over a thousand cases. We have had 13 deaths. Um, which is always regrettable, of course, um, but we've tried very hard to minimize those deaths and to, and to minimize the number of cases by enforcing a number of measures that I've spoken about. So I think we're on a pretty good trajectory. And in terms of actually setting up business in Jamaica, as Vivian said, and I think there was a question on that in the Q&A, in the question box, um, Essentially, what we're working towards is making Jamaica the best place to do business in the Caribbean. And that we're doing through enacting a whole raft of, of legislation, which is going to catapult us into the top 10 of the doing business report. We're already number six in the world in starting a business because you can do it pretty much online. But we're actually setting up a national business portal, which will allow you to do um, a number of different um, applications. So for instance, applying to the special economic zone, it'll all be online in about a year. So it, it's a big program and we're really excited about it. And the whole digitization of the economy is also going to give a big boost to our tech sector because we, we are moving up the value chain. So not only BPO, but KPO and ITO. And we have about 80 companies in our software cohort in Jamaica who are very keen and who have already done international contracts and are looking for more opportunities to par partner with global companies. So a lot going on in this space. So I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Anand now but to give him a chance to give his experience. Thanks a lot, Diane. Great, Diane. Um, great points. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to make uh, quickly three points, if I may. One, I would say, you know, when you um, look at a company and you look at the company culture, um, you know, you want to see that they, they act and behave like a family, right? And you hear that a lot. Um, what I have seen here is Jamaica as a country. You know, you bring government, you bring Jampro, you bring all the BPO players. It's one strong family. And that does not happen easily in other countries. Uh, that's the fantastic part. And, and you know, Diane talked about the tremendous support, how quickly the government, uh, the response team, all the BPO, how they come together, that, that strong collaborative uh, attitude, embodiment of that is, is a significant strength and advantage for Jamaica. And we've lived through it, you know. Uh, during times like COVID, you, you know, you unravel your real culture. And I've seen that play. And it's been a true, tremendous job by the country, uh, everybody put together. Um, the second point I'd like to make is, you know, when times are tougher, uh, like COVID or whatever situation, there is adrenaline, there is a general adrenaline among people. They want to do things, right? It's, it's a matter of harnessing that energy and moving it faster. There was no playbook. There was no playbook for managing COVID. So um, um, it was amazing to see I wouldn't be wrong if I say COVID really 
at least in, in for HGS, it brought the company together, made it made a lot more stronger. Our employee NPS during COVID shot up to close to 70. 70 NPS for employees in this industry is phenomenal, right? Um, so you could, I could see the culture play out within the company where people come together, come up with brilliant, quick solutions. Within three weeks, 2,200 people in HGS were working from home. That is rock, rock solid speed on any scale for having no playbook. That's the ingenious uh, of the team that comes together. So that's the second point I'd like to make. And uh, that was easier because the play of the government uh, in, in helping us collaboratively build a model where we could work from home and make the workplace more safer. Um, and the third point I would like to make, uh, give an example of a creative idea that the team came up with, right? Like we created something called as a SCU, self-contained units, right? SCU is a very unique model. There's no, you, you won't see it on Google. It's just something that we created. Essentially, it redesigns the organization, creates multiple SCUs so that we, it's, it's safer for people. So uh, let's say about 100 people fall within an SCU. And so they live and work within the environment. Uh, their food is brought to them, uh, their entertainment is within the area. So they really are isolated in a way within a self-contained unit. And that in a way protects them and protects the other business, right? right? If something happens in the office, uh, the whole building does not go down, but just that self-contained unit. So there are like this, there are several creative measures uh, that the industry players put in place. Uh, which I think gave a significant edge um, and a fantastic experience through this journey. Thanks very much, Anand. That's a great response. And I think it covers some of the questions that we've actually had come in over the course of the discussion on the Q&A. And ladies and gentlemen, please keep sending your questions in. We're, we're getting so many of them. And I'm going to address one of them right now. Uh, Yanni, we've had a question come in specifically for you. And, and I think this is especially important as a entrepreneur who has establish a number of different locations in different parts of the world. And the specific question is, why choose Jamaica? Why would an individual want to choose Jamaica to set up operations over other global jurisdictions? Um, thanks for that question, um, Peter. I think it was Linda who, uh, who asked it. Um, so thanks for that. But um, what I would say is, is quite, quite simple and Anand brought a point together is is the unity of the industry. I mean, when you take Jamaica versus some of our global competitors, Jamaica is, is small. There's no question about that. We're, we're similar in size to some of our competitors in Central America. Um, but, you know, when you look at the global scale, we're, we're still very small. But the unity that was, that was developed, and many, many years people have said, well, you know, the players in the industry, they talk, but they don't want to share information. They don't want to come together. And the industry association, even if it's there, it's, it's, you know, it's a small majority that is driving the advocacy. But with this, as, as Anand said, you know, pandemic with no playbook, we, we truly came together. Um, and that was one aspect of it that, that I would say why, you know, Jamaica is very special. The other aspect is, is the power of advocacy. Uh, with the government, because Jamaica is small um, and because you have access to government, you can advocate um, in, in this case in a safe manner to, to keep the industry alive um, while protecting you know, lives and livelihood um, to ensure that we continue to provide services to, to our customers. Whereas in some of the other jurisdictions that we operate in, that are larger, um, you know, we are truly at the mercy of whatever the government in those jurisdictions decide. And the fact that we have access and the government is, is, is pro um, in business generally, but understands the, essential, the, the um, essentialness of BPO, uh, it was easy for us to, um, to work very closely with them to put those protocols in place with the Ministry of Health, as Diane explained and to get the support of, of the cabinet to ensure that you know, effectiveness happened immediately in order to keep, keep the jobs uh, within the sector. So I'd say that in this case, you know, the, the small 
size of our country and access to, to policy makers is what um, has kept Jamaica extremely strong and why I would choose Jamaica over some of the larger jurisdictions. Um, and that's kind of, that's been our playbook um, thus far. And we continue to do that as we've gone into St. Lucia and look at, look at other islands in the region. Um, but Jamaica, Jamaica is our home and Jamaica is our, our biggest, our biggest um, footprint and will continue to be that way for those reasons. Thanks very much, Yoni. Um, Anand, I'm gonna go back to you for the next question. Now, this is an interesting one. Now, the, the individual who sent this in has written, other regions seem to have dropped the ball in response to COVID. And this individual has indicated that they've heard from clients uh, in particular countries that uh, certain, uh, they've had issues in terms of team members not even showing up for work. Now, talking a little bit about what you were saying with regards to the culture in Jamaica, what is it, uh, the questioner is asking about the culture in Jamaica that makes the country so resilient to disruptions like COVID based on your experience? Fantastic question. You know, it just plays on my mind um, and, you know, as I experience uh, Jamaica. And I've been um, coming to this country for eight, nine years, um, and I moved here with my family in 2017. Um, the best thing to happen to the family and to me to just live through this uh, culture. Um, you know, I've thought through this a lot, um, a lot, done a lot of data analyses, and I worked in six different countries, six different cultures, so I really have the, a broader view and um, um, a real scale to compare. And uh, I, if I have to put my finger on one thing, uh, it would be this. Competitiveness comes naturally to Jamaica. You know, it's natural for a lot of cultures, but it is pronounced in Jamaica, right? Being competitive is what do you get on the table? Easy, right? So, and the, the drawback sometimes is when you're very competitive, the collaboration takes a back seat. Um, it's a it's an arguable theory, and uh, the best part I have seen in Jamaica is being outright cutthroat, competitive, at the same time harnessing that collaboration power. And I can cite so many examples. I've seen this play within the company. I've seen this play at a country level. I've seen this play across industries. The most unique thing to me culturally that's very rich about Jamaica is that cutthroat competition, very healthy, essential for business to prosper. At the same time, when times are tough or whatever reason we want to create a better future, everybody comes together. There is a higher degree of collaboration at all levels. You know, the, the family sentiment that I talked about at a, at a country level, one taking care of the other, right? I'm in problem sometimes. I call Yanni, right? I don't think. Right? We compete. I call Lynn. They call me. It's easy. It's a family. I think, so, so Peter, I would put it as the combination of competitiveness and collaboration at its best is what Jamaica brings better than any other country. Thanks. That's a fantastic answer, Anand. Greatly appreciate that. Now, Vivian, I've got a question that's come in for you in terms of uh, perhaps explaining a little bit uh, what the services are that Jampro can provide an outsourcer if they're looking to expand in Jamaica. What would some of the key points be to that? Okay, I'll answer that question, um, Peter. In, in addition to us being a one-stop shop, we manage investors from end to end. So the moment you meet us, we're sharing with you um, experiences about the country. We're sharing you, with you market intelligence that you would not normally garner um, being new to the country. And so um, on the basic stuff, we're providing site selection, you know, office space, um, housing for expats, connections with the key stakeholders of government and industry. And we have an excellent aftercare service that even after your operation is set up, we continue to work with you to smooth out any um, difficulty you may have in your normal operations. So that has proven uh, successful for the companies that are here. So much that our expansion um, within the industry, 50% of our growth is coming from current operators. And we have teams that work with them to build up, um, on their, their goals for growth. 
Thanks very much, Vivian. Um, I'm going to flip it over talking a little bit about expansion and about different partnership opportunities. Diane, I'd like to get your thoughts on this one. We've had a, a question come in from overseas, from South Africa specifically. Would Jamaica be opening to partnering with BPO companies that are based in South Africa for areas uh, each of the country may not uh, be of strength and where the other may be strong? So effectively for, for I think, complementary areas. Um, any particular thoughts on international partnerships between Jamaica and South Africa or any other country for that matter when it comes to outsourcing? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for that question. Um, I think we are open to partnerships with anyone um, where we find complementarity. I spoke of about 80 companies in our local um, IT sector. So we, we kind of have a whole continuum of companies here because we have about 60 international companies who are doing mainly BPO, but some of them are doing finance and accounting. Some of them are doing legal work, some healthcare work. Um, and then we have on top of that, another about 80 local companies that are also in the software development space, app development, cybersecurity, uh, banking applications. It's, it's really a pretty wide range of services. So what we're about is developing partnerships at every level and right across that spectrum. So the great thing about Jamaica is we can grow in two ways, by inviting companies to come in and set up their own operations, which of course we facilitate, as Vivian just said, and also helping local companies and foreign owned companies to find new markets. So we work both inward and outward. And so we are constantly looking for partnerships that can enhance the, the range of services that we can offer. And one of the things that we have done to, to, to build our local talent pool is the global services sector project which um, allows and offers apprenticeship operation, um, opportunities to um, upskill young people, um, competitive fund to co-fund with local companies, the upskilling of their staff. Um, and there, there are a lot of different opportunities within that pro project as well. So yes, to South Africa and to any other country that's interested in partnering with us, we really look for complementarity in the, in the growth of our, um, our industry. And what's I think also exciting is that we have tackled a lot of problems and solved a lot of problems through our products and services that face other similar countries at a similar level of development. So we have solutions that we can work with, work on together. So yes, a huge, you know that Jamaicans are known for their creativity. So, Very much so. Very um, this, much this so. is something that we bring to the table in problem solving and troubleshooting hackathons and, and the raft of those kinds of activities. So big on partnership. Thank you very much for that, Diane. Now, uh, Yoni, I'm going to throw it back to you. We've had a number of questions that have popped into the Q&A box. And again, ladies and gentlemen, please keep them coming. We're getting some great mind share. And I think we're going to be going right to noon, the way it's noon Eastern, that is, in terms of some of the questions and answering them. Yoni, we've had a number of uh, questions that have flown in the last little while that have related to work at home. Um, I'm going to try and ask you to nail them all down in one fell swoop. So roughly speaking, how do you see work at home as it stands right now in Jamaica as a business model of choice? And how do you see the potential of Jamaica to accommodate more work at home individuals or individuals that are providing frontline services from their residences as we move into 2021? So um, <clears throat> we have been working with the special economic zone and JAMPRO and, and the government um, to, to develop a policy that is going to be beneficial to the, to the government, um, to the employees and to the operators operating in Jamaica. Um, you know, as, as it has been said today at the height of the pandemic when we um, got the initial approval which was to essentially move as as many um, work uh, workers to work at home as possible, to order to keep the jobs and to keep the client service and keep the business afloat. Um, many have have reduced that uh, back for many reasons, and and the the policy that we're we're attempting to to get passed in in short order 
is you know to allow for 30 to 40 percent of your workforce to work from home um, on a regular basis so the goal is to, to make work at home a big part of the sector going forward given what you know what everyone's terming the new normal as we you know work through the the, the continuation of, of this pandemic um, you know there are a lot of benefits to, to operating in Jamaica, Jamaica from a fiscal perspective um, you know low tax regime um, you know, no, no duty and taxes on capital equipment that is brought in for your operation. And you know, one of the things the government wants to ensure is that there's no tax leakage from that perspective. So, you know, inside of the, the policy that's being developed is that the companies have to be SEZ. The companies have to be, have a physical presence in Jamaica, um, not just a virtual presence. Um, and the companies have to comply with all of those, those regulations and laws in order to be approved to, to, to work with um, those fiscal benefits within the work at home. And that's, it's not been approved as yet, but that is what we have put forth in the position paper that the, the GSAJ and JAMPRO have put to, to the SEZ and to the, the minister in charge of our, our industry that has been taken to cabinet for initial approval before the, the drafting of those policies could, could be done. But it's, uh, it, again, uh, to the, what has been echoed so far is it is a, an all of industry wide um, support that everyone has been able to throw their hat in the ring as to what they feel may benefit their their clients or their business or their employees but it is work at home is a uh, work at home is definitely within our purview for the long term Fantastic. Thank you very much, Yoni. Um, we've got one last question I think we've got time for and Vivian, I'm going to throw it back to you for this one. And Anand, I would like to get your thoughts as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what JamPro and providers on the ground are doing to try and promote impact sourcing? Now, for those of you who might not be aware, the concept of impact sourcing is to try and find a, a socially responsible manner of providing outsourced services and to drive this by working with perhaps disadvantaged communities to bring members of those communities into the labor force and provide them with career opportunities and a chance to thrive. So Vivian and Anand, we'll finish off with you for the Q&A. If you could both address this in 30 seconds or less each, please. Oh, Peter, that's, that's an area I would leave to the operators to answer. Um, they, they are on the hiring front and they do hire a wide cross section of persons, um, whether with, with um, disabilities or other um, qualities, just to balance their workforce, both male and female. Jamaica has a significantly high percent of female employees as well versus other countries. But I'll, I'll leave that question to Anand and, and possibly to Yoni to take care of. Great idea. Okay. Can so I just Anand, jump in? Sure, can I Diane, just jump in, Peter, before um, Anand? Um, we have done um, some significant work with Avasan Foundation on impact sourcing. For about three years, they ran an, a sourcing opportunity where we helped them to recruit inner city kids, sort of as at-risk kids. And the results are actually pretty phenomenal because the companies participated in the model and did some of the training and you got something like a 96% take up rate of the graduates of the program who were immediately snapped up by employers and who got jobs. So it was a really fantastic um, operation and we are going to find ways to continue that operation. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So Anand and then Yanni will finish off with you. Okay, great. I think this is such an important and a timely uh, topic, right? Impact sourcing has always been very critical to the industry and it can really catapult to the next level considering, uh, you know, work from home as a realistic long-term option, right? And uh, like Diane talked about, Avisan, there, there are a lot of uh, um, activities in Jamaica uh, to provide opportunity for people with um, different challenges, you know, really, uh, to go to the inner cities. And our ability to do impact sourcing goes 10x as we continue to strengthen the speed and spread of internet into the inner cities and create this model that we're all working on right now where somebody 
uh, in, in, you know, inside a country in a remote city who's challenged, we create an environment for them within their space where they can be productive, where their, their economic um, opportunity comes alive. Uh, it's, a, it's a great thing to do. Uh, and Jamaica, you know, general, the IQ levels are very high among people. So it just makes it easy to drive the impact sourcing to a higher degree here. Fantastic. Thank you, Anand. Yanni, uh, some thoughts on impact sourcing from the ITIL BPO perspective. Um, you know, we have um, certainly done done some ourselves. Um, not not in a in a big stage, but it is it is something that uh, we continue to to work within the communities to to go into the schools and and support training initiatives um, with individuals, um, especially from you know low. Uh, lower income generating communities where we can help bolster the, 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 the lack of education opportunity for the individuals to, to bring them into the sector. Um, you know, one thing that, that I would touch on from this perspective as well too, that Diane mentioned earlier, that is a, a really big opportunity for Jamaica is um, the, the global services sector project. Um, you know, and that is something that we have not only looked at it um, on the, the training of, of individuals that are looking to get into the industry, but also upskilling agents um, to you know, bring them the value chain, whether that's to be in other, other industries or other business units within the operations, or to bring them into positions where they can become supervisors and managers and really bring in Jamaicans to that, to that next level. Um, so I think you know, it's something that it's in its infancy stages today, but it's, uh, I know that many are, are still are open to it and, and attempting to, to see that grow. Great. Thanks, Yanni. And we have come to, well, we're just past the hour. So I, I want to say a big thank you to all our panelists who took some time out of their day to talk a little bit about some of the key issues as it relates to Jamaica, to BPO, and to the resiliency of the, the country as we move into uh, the post-pandemic period. I'd like to thank the individuals who chose to take part as audience members today and for sending your questions. And there's just been a fantastic amount of mind share over the course of the past 60 minutes. Thank you so much to everybody for your participation. We truly look forward to communicating with you the results of the webinar as uh, the webinar is recorded and will be transmitted as well as any subsequent learnings uh, from the standpoint of literature that will be developed on the back of it, which will be forthcoming. A great rest of this Tuesday to everybody, wherever you might be in the world, whether it is overseas or within the Americas. It's great to have had the connections today and we look forward to catching up with you very soon. Stay healthy, stay safe.